We're gonna talk about all the myths and all misconceptions that go around protection, personal protection dogs and personal protection dog training. The dogs in Europe, let's talk about that first. The dogs in Europe um, that are sold to these companies are very interesting. I, uh, I will tell you I train dogs for more than 40 years now. I go to Europe to teach, to give seminars to sport people, to police, to military. And I'm very familiar with how the dog dealers work and how dogs get moved around in the whole world. The personal protection dog market is very interesting in terms of are, are those dogs really the best dogs? Are they really worth 30, 50, 70, 150 thousand dollars? And sometimes they are, but most of the times they are not. In fact, most of the times when you look at a dog that it's purchased and it's imported from overseas to you this should already give you some alarm it should give you a red flag that's not the time to say wow i'm getting an import this is not like you're buying a bmw or a porsche or a ferrari it's a different market than the cars and boats so when you're buying a dog from europe that's going to be trained or it's already trained as a protection dog this dog <coughs> the chances are it failed to be a top level prote uh, a top level sport dog meaning he cannot do the the protection programs or they can do the protection sport programs but not to the level that it's required therefore they basically get rejected from the sport and they get sold to the Americans and then you know the story from there those dogs get to be retrained or not done anything to them and just because they are imported from Europe that's just a somewhat a bonus and, and it should mean something special as I said just like you would buy a Ferrari Lamborghini something European but it's it's basically you you really need to consider the you might be getting a dog that's rejected from a sport program you also probably are getting a dog that's rejected from a police or army but it's basically the dogs that don't make it that don't have what it takes to become a, a top level sport dog or what it takes to become a top level police dog they get rejected from these programs they get sold of course they have a little bit of training of course they show very well and and now we think oh wow this is a dog that uh, that company went to europe and did travel 20 countries and tested 
500 dogs and this is that dog that they selected. That's bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, but that, that's not how it works. When you go there, those trainers and those people are educated. They do the same thing I do for business. And if they have something valuable, they will sell it for a lot of money. No company in the United States will go there and buy something that doesn't cost and then resell it here. It, it will not make sense to go there, buy a dog for 50000 and try to sell it for 50000 They buy dogs that are worth five, maximum ten, at the least, maybe 15000 and then they present your, the package that, okay, this is the dog and it's coming from Germany, Austria, Slovenia, whatever country. It's, we selected it, it's the best dog, therefore it's worth 60 or more. And, and that, that's, a, it's just not right. But when you don't know how the market works, yeah, you will get trapped and you will buy this type of dogs and you will believe that they are worth something and that they actually can do what they are supposed to do. When you watch dog training videos, when you watch the dogs during training, it is not hard to make a dog look like a super dog. If you know a little bit about dog training and you're presenting a dog to somebody that doesn't know at all what protection training is about you can make um, a labla doodle do a phenomenal protection work you can make a dachshund do a phenomenal protection work it, it will you know it, this is a like how you would do the the ww the wrestlemania this kind of stage fighting it's very easy to be done with protection dogs, especially when you know that the clients you're dealing with don't have the knowledge. So it, that, that's something to really make sure that you understand. You cannot, you really cannot think, oh, this dog is from Europe, it must be good. No, it's actually the opposite. I would be very reluctant I will ask a lot of questions and I will do a lot of testing which I'm gonna to talk to you in a second about um, so this is your your European dogs now when when I sell protection dogs and when I'm talking about protection dogs with my clients I always give this kind of uh, um, example if you if you imagine that the dog from zero to a ten assuming zero is a super friendly super social super outgoing dog that just biting is not doesn't never even crosses that dog's mind and 10 is the other extreme. Super aggressive, very untrustful, uh, very sharp, reactive. It will bite and it will not wait for a command. It will not wait to judge. It will just bite. Very unsafe, very dangerous and very unpredictable. Actually, I wouldn't say unpredictable because we know he's going to bite. And we know it's not going to bite going behind you and, you know, nipping at your ankles. It's actually going to do a serious damage and it's going to go straight forward. So we have the very friendly and the super aggressive dog in both extremes. When we talk about a personal protection dog and what I like to select for a personal protection dog is something that's going to kind of come more into the middle. What you need to understand is that the more social the dog is, 
the less suspicion level that dog's gonna have, right? So if the dog is friendly, if it's outgoing, that means the dog is very trustful and it just lives in the world that everything is pink and everything is just, just there is no threats, there is nothing bad happening, nothing, nothing to worry about. The other extreme, very dangerous, very suspicious, living in a war. Looking for something more into the middle, that that would be the kind of dog that will do protection but remain social. And then as you're thinking what kind of dog you want, you need to really, really, really think about this because when you say, oh, I want a super friendly dog and I want to be a really badass and, and just go insane and fight with five people. That, that's a, you know, something you can see in the movies. Maybe Rin Tin Tin can do this, but that's not a realistic. That's one in 10 million dogs probably. So you have to give in and you have to decide on which side you want to give in a little bit. The sociability, if you give up, then you're raising the suspicious level. If the suspicious level is too high, you're going to take it away from the sociability, right? So that's what we need to really uh, uh, be careful when you, when you think about this. Um, and, and typically people think that if a dog can be a good police dog, it can be a very good protection dog. Or if it's going to be a sport dog, will not make a good protection dog. Those are all catches. Those are all marketing uh, um, strategies the companies will present you, depending on what kind of dog they have. If they were able to purchase a sport dog that was rejected, they will promote that a little bit more. If it was the other way around, then they will promote that a little bit more. It's marketing, so whatever I have, I'm gonna try to make it better for you, and I'll convince you to buy it. And, and you have to be aware of that, and you have to be careful. Um, the, the interesting thing about protection dogs, a real protection dogs, it's that they're, in my opinion, the most difficult dog to come across to. And if you breed, as I do, I've been breeding for 30 years and I'm selecting dogs and, and do that all of my life, um, there is some, some things that become very real, what, what works and what doesn't work. And what doesn't work in protection dog is the, there is, there is a surprise element. So when you think about police dogs, Navy SEALs, whatever army style dogs, they have something in their advantage that a personal protection dog does not have. And what that is, it's the build up to the bite. So if you look at a police dog, the police dog loads up in the car, the sirens go off, then there is some kind of chase, then the, the police officer is with the dog, with the whole unit, at some door or gate, kneeling down, giving their spill, stop, I'm gonna send the dog, come out. These are all preparations. This is all a very nice buildup for a dog, which prepares the dog for what's coming. When we're talking protection dogs, unfortunately, that element is not there. Protection, whenever a protection dog is needed, most of the time, and I would say 99% of the time, the situation is very surprising. Something just happens. 
Like you can be at Starbucks, you can be uh, sitting at home, you can be in your car in a parking lot. It will happen at the most unexpected time. That means the dog's gonna have zero preparation, zero. Now, I will give you an analogy with uh, um, martial arts. Let's say jiu-jitsu, muay thai, whatever, boxing, whatever style of fighting. You can have a kid, you can have a, a 30-year-old guy that is black belt in whatever martial arts you want. If they do not have the heart and the genetics to respond during a surprise time properly to fight, they will panic, they will get kind of tight muscles, and they will not be able to respond. But they might be the best person in their gym. They may be a, a UFC champion because they know how to fight in a certain circumstances. It's different when somebody approaches you at the ATM machine, taps you on the shoulder and asks for your money. Some people will turn around and go straight to either a punch or put the guy on the ground, or at least attempt to do that. I'm not saying that's a smart decision or a smart choice. Probably it's not. But in a dog, a protection dog, you need this kind of response. You need this dog to be genetically predisposition to respond exactly that way under surprise. So let's say in your house, the dog is on its dog bed, it's 2 a.m. Somebody's already inside the house. No, he's not breaking the window, no, he's not yelling, he's already in. The dog wakes up and sees that person. Few things can happen, just like with the guy at the ATM. It can get spooked. It can start barking with a popcorn bark. It can even run away. It can pretend that nothing is happening because it doesn't fit any training scenario that the dog has ever experienced. Or it will do the thing that you want him to do, and that's basically get up and do what it's supposed to do. And that has nothing to do with fear or no fear in that dog. That's just a response. Either you go forward or you wait or you go back. Dogs that go forward under surprise, that has not much to do with training, if anything.
Training teaches you technique, just like how we are talking about martial arts. Fight on the street, when you fight in a bar, or when you get surprised in your house, or when you get surprised in your car, or anywhere you get surprised. You either have that genetic predisposition to respond immediately with a fight or not. Your training will kick in only after your first response. And that first response is a genetic makeup. So when you select, or when I select a dog, that's the very first thing that I pay attention to. A dog can be trained, you can make beautiful protection work. If the dog does not know how to respond under these circumstances, there is, uh, it's not a protection dog as far as I'm concerned. If that dog's gonna need two three, maybe four commands and encouragement to say, hey, buddy, really, this is really happening. Do something. Why are you waiting? What are you wondering? Go, get him. That's too late. It's just too late. Surprise and immediate proper response. That's genetic. Okay? So when you have the very friendly and the most extreme dog, that still doesn't tell you which and how far if that dog has that proper response under surprise. But if you select, if, if you have that, then you can keep that dog social for the most of its life. And that dog always will be ready to respond that way moving forward, okay? That's how important this uh, genetic makeup is. And this is why a police dog that can be a phenomenal police dog with 300 real street bikes still will be shaken in some cases under a surprising situation when somebody just jumps right out of nowhere or actually somebody just walks up and that's very friendly it just so happens that it has a gun that's pointed at the person and now you're telling your dog to go and do something and the dog is like there is nobody that's yelling there is nobody that's jumping why would i do that that's a, a bad training and most likely also a bad dog not suitable for personal protection so what I'm trying to tell you is that dogs that do personal protection a real personal protection dog it's actually the most special animal because so many things so many components have to come together you have the genetic makeup, then you have the training. And the training is critical as well. But no matter what the training is, if you don't have the genetic makeup, leave it alone. Now, if I'm talking to you about training, watch on YouTube. There is like zillions of companies with very funny videos. You will have guys doing bite work with wearing shorts and a hidden sleeve. This is pathetic. I, I am blown away. I cannot imagine who is that person that will pay this kind of money for a dog that it's everything is so staged and so fake that, that even when you don't have experience, you know that this is a game for the dog. There is absolutely no intentions. I mean, you're wearing shorts 
and you're stuffing a hidden sleeve in the dog's mouth. It's not how it works. It's really not how it works. A dog has to be able to, to neutralize, and that means in most situations, he shouldn't even go for what is presented. Because normally, when you present something, it's something so you can protect yourself. So even if a dog is coming at me and I give him my arm, I will decide which arm to give so I can do something else. Or I will decide to even give him my phone or my shirt. I will put him onto something. And as long as that dog goes and takes that, that's not a, a protection dog. He's just, okay, I'm coming. Give me something, tell me what to bite. It doesn't work that way. A protection dog cannot be, or should not be fooled with, oh, bite me here, or, oh, bite me here. In fact, it should be trained to do quite the opposite and avoid all these traps, okay? So when, when we're talking about training and you're watching videos and you're trying to, to think can make a decision if, if you're making a, a good choice. Decide for yourself and, and, and see if the, how staged this is, okay? Um, another interesting training thing, a big misconception. It's the, the dog going for the weapon hand. So like if I am holding a gun with my right hand, we should expect that the dog makes that decision and neutralizes the gun. That's a big circus. In real life, that's a, a, a joke. What a dog really needs to do when we are having a trained protection dog, he needs to come and he needs to come with this 150% commitment towards the person, charging with a lightning speed. This is the essence. Lightning fast speed charging and going to, for an impact, anywhere. He should not judge which hand. Any judgment like this slows the dog down, makes the dog question, makes the dog think. That gives time to the person to neutralize the dog, okay? So, going for the weapon hand, it's a, it's a very, very confusing, um, and, and it basically, Anyone that tells you that that's what a dog should do, they either do not understand protection dog training or they're just trying to sell you snake oil. That's all. Again, protection dog needs to be absolutely committed, not judging, oh my God, I have to bite here. No, I have to go and I have to put that person on the floor. That's my job. Okay, so the, the weapon arm, forget about this, it's a joke, absolutely joke, okay? Another one, that's a very interesting one. Some, some people, companies will tell you that the dog supposedly knows they, they are so in tuned with the environment and you and the situation that they actually know who is the bad guy and they know when the bad guy is going to act. Hello. This is, you, you cannot be serious. If, you, if you're actually going to listen to somebody and you end up buying a dog, that supposedly knows all this, uh, um, you just spend a lot of money for nothing. Okay? That, that's, a, that's a complete joke. That's even worse. 
than the one we just talked about, the, the weapon hand. Dogs don't know. Dogs will, you know, as we said, the very social dog, he will never even think, no, everybody's friends, it doesn't matter. The one that's super aggressive, he will pick on anybody, he doesn't even need to look at him. On top of that, a dog can make all sorts of decisions and they will be wrong decisions. Like if you, if you really believe or somebody can convince you that a dog can make this kind of judgment, that means both of you, the, the, the person that's trying to sell you the dog and you have read a lot of books and watched a lot of Lassie movies and Rin Tin Tin and, and, and you know, this is, this is uh, not realistic, okay? That does not happen. It will be, uh, anytime a dog decides to go on its own, chances are it's gonna make wrong decision or it will not make decision whatsoever, okay? So there is situations, you can have a, a situation where the dog is, let's say, in the house and it's by itself. When somebody tries to come and break into the house, you would expect the dog to do what it's trained and what it's supposed to do. Now that's realistic. But if you and me are sitting next to each other talking and all of a sudden I say just call the bank and, and transfer $100,000 or I'm going to shoot you, your dog's not going to do shit. He will have zero clue what's going on. Okay? On another hand, I can get very emotional I can be very frustrated, I can jump up, hey, whoa! And I have zero intention to fight with anybody. That should not mean that you, that dog will make the decision again and attack me. Dogs that are trained for protection, that are really trained for protection, can make decision on their own, only when they are alone. So that means protect the car, protect the house, protect the area. But if I am around, I give the decisions. I decide who to buy. And most of the times it's not the people that are jumping around. It's the people that don't do anything because they don't want to draw attention. And a well-trained a well -trained protection dog has to make that difference. And he has to trust me when I say, this is the bad person and don't hesitate tenth of a second you need to neutralize okay and the other way around if i if i say no nothing is going on then nothing is going on okay um but don't don't fall for this uh, tricks in the market that the dog knows because the dog does not know. Um, there is, with the training, there is a lot. There is just actually quite a bit to do with, with the training. You can have um, um, There, there was a time in the past, and I come from Eastern European countries, so I have uh, um, early on a lot of experience with this kind of training. And this is when the dogs are trained to rebite, meaning you try to punch with that hand, the dog bites here, and then you try to do something with the other hand, it comes here, 
you try to kick, he comes here, and so on. In theory, it sounds very cool. It actually works in practice. Like I can make, I can train a dog to do this, and it will look very pretty. It will really look like, a, I don't know, again, some, some, some form of martial arts. The problem with this is the commitment and the intensity and the impact and the power of the biting. When you have a dog that comes here and bites and it's in his mind thinking already, okay, let me see which, what do I need to do else? Oh, this arm's gonna come, I've gotta be ready here. That means that bite is not 100%. That means he's ready to let go so he can do this. So all we get is a lot of nipping. I'm not saying nipping doesn't hurt, but when you have commitment and when you have one bite, no matter, no matter where it is, and then you have the dog that's just gonna just put all of its power into that one bite and push you and pull you and shake you you have very little time before you start to feel lightheaded and eventually you start to pass out the idea with protection is sometimes you will have that whatever bad person is, that he will be on some kind of drugs, he will get bit, and he will look at it, and it's like, oh, that doesn't even hurt. Of course, it doesn't hurt when you're on something, and they can move on. So we need a dog that actually can do more than just that. We need a dog that's going to fight, that's going to pull, and give you just enough time for you to either get out or do something. Of course, we can have all these uh, interesting training scenarios. We can have a dog walking backwards, how it's done in the, the ring programs, the Belgian, French, Mondial ring. It's called the defensive handler exercise. But it's an exercise. So this, in some ways, it can be practical. But then we go to some other ones where we will put a object and we will say guard the object. First of all, you will never put your briefcase with your valuable documents or money or whatever it is in that suitcase or a bag on the floor. Tell the dog to guard it and you go somewhere else to do something else. Like if you, if you think that that's going to work, um, you, you're just lying to yourself, okay? This is, this is sport training. This is nothing to do with reality. Um, generally speaking, protection dogs should know very little. Like there is not... Um, um, I am always amazed when I read and I go through the different companies there, different levels. You have the basic level executive and level three and all sorts of different, you know, names. And in, in most instances, all it is, it's about how much the dog is going to be sold to you. So yes, if it's executive or something like that, it's going to be a lot of money. And if it's a level one, then most likely that means we have that really, really social dog that maybe just going to do some barking. Training is an interesting thing. It's a, you know, uh, when when we talk about advanced training, we get confused. People get confused and, and trainers confuse you because it's not, when you're, when you're thinking of training, we're not thinking about 
how many behaviors, how many scenarios the dog can do. Can he guard an object? Can he do find different articles? Can he go tracking and so on? Can he work on this or this or whatever? It's it's a uh, in fact the the more the dog knows that means the more maintenance training you need to do if you want to maintain those behaviors and those scenarios if the dog knows something but it doesn't get practiced often enough it's gonna go away that's that's what's gonna happen um, I get not often but every once in a while when I talk to clients or possible clients there would be oh I, I want my dog to to also do tracking and find people and things and and that's all great but you need to understand that everything that you add in requires training requires maintenance you cannot like let's say if I when I go tracking just for sport forget about like uh, uh, search for a person or you know like when I do seminars for police or search and rescue organizations it's a whole different level of tracking that requires even more time and more different development of the dog but just for me going to sport competitions for tracking that takes two to three times a week going tracking that means I'm gonna go to a places that it's unfamiliar I'm gonna lay a track I'm gonna wait another hour or two and then I'm gonna go get the dog and do tracking that takes a lot of time and then you need to think do you really need that or not because if you really do just doing something to fake it to say that you're doing it it's not gonna matter if the dog really needs to go and search and find something now assuming that you really do need that then you have to understand that that's very time consuming and besides time consuming it, it requires knowledge like it requires serious knowledge so you need to understand a lot about what tracking is about and that's just one aspect if we are doing as we said the guard of object or or any of those fancy exercises that you see on youtube those also require a lot of training, a lot of maintenance. And then where is the application? How much do you really need that? And is it, is it possible and is it visible? Does it make sense? You know, those are things to, to consider when you go along. Anything that is added on, it will cost more. That's just the norm, it, it's, it's normal but then it's not practical so for me in my in my company and what I do when we're talking about advanced training basically advanced training would mean the dog being able to perform the basic skills under more complicated circumstances okay so so if it means we're gonna do a search I'm gonna want my dog to find somebody and that's in the house I will put that person in a very very difficult place for the dog to find them I will take him to some warehouses or a school or just some some buildings that I will use and do some searches but I have to still be reasonable and not add on new things a real protection dog needs to do several things and they're basic things basic basic scenarios it's just that it has to happen under all circumstances okay so it's not about how many exercises and how many things the dog can do it's about knowing few things much less but being able to do them under very different circumstances that's um, something that always get confused in training when you do protection training like let's say when I'm training protection dog 
it starts with the when the dog is born looking into the genetics looking into this genetic predisposition for that reaction under surprise confidence level courage power strength you can have some super dog that it's maybe 55 pounds or 20 kilos or 18 kilos that would not stop a man you know it, it just will not you need something that is a little bit more substantial now there is a whole different talk about you know we, 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 we will go into the different breeds in a second but you, you are looking when you're talking protection you're really looking into dog that it's physically capable to at least do some opposition you can have the meanest motherfucker grabbing you and it's way 30 pounds and you're like wow that's very cool let me go on and do what I need to do yeah that, that's uh, unless you have four of them then yeah they might be they might do something but one it's not gonna stop nobody no not even a 12 year old all right unless unless somebody is really really scared of dogs but then you don't need a protection dog now that brings us to the different breeds of dogs you know i breed malinois i've done this since the 80s i have my preferences i train all dogs i train literally all dogs all breeds nevertheless my top one choice is a belgian malinois and so is the choice for the Navy SEALs, and so is the choice for the majority of police departments nowadays, and so on. Few reasons for this. It's not to take away from a Presa Canario, Rottweiler, um, any of the Mastiff breeds. They're super powerful. When they get you, if they have that courage to get you, which a lot of times they don't, they can do a lot of damage they can stop you the problem is uh, the problems are it's not one problem a big problem is health most of those breeds have very poor health they have bad elbows hips spine eyes that's a very very serious problem okay the other problem is that most of them are not really selected to do this kind of work. They are not bred selectively for years to do this. It's not to say that there is no single one that it's good. Yes, there are some, some dogs that are quite good. But you can have a Caucasian of Charka. You can have an Atolian. You can have a, a Bull Mastiff. You can have Borbel. You can have all these big ass strong powerful guard dogs and they can do something very nice but they will lack other things combined with the health it just doesn't make it functional generally speaking the herding breeds and that's the that's your German Shepherd and a Belgian Shepherd and you know most of the Shepherd dogs they are very trainable they are very in tune and very uh, uh, family oriented and that's that's big like a Caucasian of Charco will guard your house will guard for his own sake but not necessarily protect you to where a Malinois adapts very quickly 
to a family and it becomes a pack. And then it's us against whomever. Okay? It's a different different way. And those dogs are selected for many generations to do this. The way they bite, the way they think, the, the confidence level, the social level, all this plays a role. And all this comes to that super extreme and that super extreme to somewhere in the middle and having that surprise reaction that is the correct reaction. Okay, so this is kind of why I, my, my choice is a, a Malinois. Uh, but again, you, you would need not a kitten. You don't need a 30 pound Malinois, no matter how fearless it is. It's still gonna be a 30 pound. It will not be able to do much, unless again, you have four of them, which is a doable. Um, so you have selection, then you, it is important how you raise that dog. You know, it's, a, it's very important how you raise the dog. Similar to how you would train fighters. You know, they cannot, they cannot be pushed too far. They have to believe in themselves. They also have to have that natural instinct of, I am somebody. And when we get dogs from Europe, and they are presented as the best ones, you definitely don't know how it's raised. You definitely don't know their reaction. You definitely don't know genetically what it takes to back them off. Um, any training that the dog has prior to becoming a protection dog can affect and will affect the dog's future for good and for bad. So, I will give you some example of this. Let's say some top sport trainer selects a dog, says, okay, that's a nice German Shepherd, it's from really good lines, and I want to win the world championship, so I take that puppy, I raise it, and I do all this sport training. Now the puppy is about seven months or a year and a half old, and I start to see that the dog is a little more questionable. It doesn't have the heart, it doesn't have the courage, it doesn't have the quality of the bite, it doesn't have the power, it doesn't have that confidence level and aggression. Because when you're pushed, you cannot back off. You have to go forward. And you have to mean it. And when you recognize that that's not the right dog, it can look like it is, but it's not then it gets sold to the companies in the States. And then they sell it and they be, give you that big display of, you know, WrestleMania. And, and you, you think you got a super dog. And hopefully you don't need to ever be put in that situation that, that you find out the, the wrong way. And this happens. This happens, um, I teach, as I say, I, I go almost on a monthly basis somewhere in the world, in the country here. I give a lot of, I help a lot of police departments, uh, special forces. There are times and there are places where I am mind blown how, um, a police officer really believes that they have this partner next to them that's gonna do what they're supposed to do. And they find out that it's not happening at the worst time in their life. And that's because of lack of understanding and lack of correct training. 
And when you do the proper training, you know, just as when I do, a dog can come at me and I can just stop it. Say, okay, this, what, what are you doing? Not like this, but similar. And the dog does not know what to do. It's in a checkmate. Sometimes it's training, sometimes it's the genetics, and most of the time it's a combination of the two. The dogs that are just lacking training, it takes maybe 10, 15, 20 sessions, just enough to give them the green light and say, hey, you can go on, you don't need to wait for me. You can do your job. But a lot of dogs get sold. Two police departments, very similarly, as they are sold to as a personal protection dogs. They're just not meant to be doing this kind of work. They don't have the heart, courage, the, the, the whole mindset is not there. And training cannot make up for genetics. You need the genetic component and then you need excellent training. Um, dog needs to be exposed on a lot of different scenarios. They need to understand that when you tell them to go ahead and protect and do their job, they have to go and do it. There is no questioning. There is no looking, oh, well, he doesn't wear that big, fat arm, so what do I do? Oh, he's just wearing t-shirt. Can I just do this? Oh, he doesn't have anything. Or, oh, he has this, like, I don't know, some, some big scary thing. What do I do? Or he doesn't have anywhere to buy. These are all scenarios that the dog has to be exposed. But um, when you have a, a, a really good dog, that training goes fast. What is more complicated is actually not the biting training but the opposite. So let's say when I when I'm training a dog, I will give you uh, just I don't want to give you too much of my training scenarios because I know everybody's watching and waiting. But here is one. Let's say we go to a hotel and it's you and your dog. It's a foreign place. It's not his territory. Someone's at the door, walks in, the dog needs to react. There is no knocking, there is no who it is, I'm gonna send my dog, no. Somebody walks in, the dog needs to react. He has to react. After that training session, it's gonna take me probably, I would say, another 10 training sessions that I'm gonna go to different hotels and different places like this and show that dog that we don't live in a war zone, that actually there will be a maid that's gonna walk by, that there will be people walking in and we don't just attack everybody and anything. This is the more time consuming in a real protection training than the actual biting. When we have the right genetics and the right training, the training scenarios that go around the protection itself compared to the part that balances the protection are probably five to 95%. I want that dog to be comfortable. I want that dog to just know that there can be a moment, but they should not live in a war zone unless there is a war zone so when you 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 also can do something that i do this is one more thing that i'm gonna mention and as i say i don't like to give out too much of my uh, uh training away but when you think how it used to be in the airports you had a different coding oh it's uh 
blue, green, orange, red alert, right? So you can have a dog that can be just normal because really nothing is going on. And then if you feel that somebody starts to really be stalking around the house or the, your neighborhood or whatever, or you hear something on the news, or you go in a new area where you have that conscious feeling, okay, this is, I, I don't feel safe right now. You can elevate the suspicious level through training. And you can make that dog that's, let's say, within the five and six of the two extreme, you can bring it up. Or you can manage it a little bit less that way. Okay, but this you can do only with the right dog. You cannot play games like this when it comes to real protection. And then as a, as a person that likes to buy protection dogs, again, try not to, not to think that the dogs have some supernatural qualities and you know they can read minds and they can feel situations and yes they do but that doesn't mean they they are right you know you can have a an older guy or a drunken person just walking up to you wanting a lighter it, it's okay that the dog shows a little bit of hey what is this but you know that's all it is and then you can have somebody that's just going to walk very nicely and just going to look like he's not even paying attention to nothing and just going to walk right by you and do something. And before he does or after he does, you got to be able to do, to tell the dog that it's time. And you got to be able to tell that dog that it's time once and that's it. Right? It's with the training, when we talk about, again, it's not a, a, I know it's very difficult for a person that wants to buy a dog. And sometimes, sometimes you might be that person that already had one protection dog or two protection dogs and it's like, on, okay, no, I'm now a seasoned, I'm an expert, I, I have protection dog. And we've done these scenarios and my dog has done these things. You have not done real scenarios until you actually do real scenarios. And the real scenarios are taking you and your dog by surprise and they're not staged at a, as a WrestleMania fake fighting. They're very easy to do actually. It's only the you and your dog should not know. Um, anyway, I that that's end up being quite a long video. It's been in my head to do it for quite some time. Um, in the near future, I'm gonna start putting few more interesting specifically strictly protection training and protection dog selection videos. If you want to, you know how to contact me. You know my website, it's right down there. You can send an email, you can message. And if it's a interesting topic or interesting questions, I'll be glad to help. All right.